I didn't know what to expect with the, um, with the music this morning, but I'm really kind of glad we still had the Christmas carols because I told my kids that we celebrate Christmas all the way at least until New Year's Day in our house. So interestingly enough, we've been celebrating Advent here at the church, and Advent, um, really, when you understand the church calendar, Advent is the marks of the beginning of the new year for the church. So really, when we look at the liturgical calendar for the church, the new year starts with Christmas. It doesn't start in January. And and that's interesting given the fact that we've been talking about preparing him room and what a way to leave off the Christmas series and start the new year with the last sermon in our series called Preparing Him Room. And I think today, um, this was what I was planning on preaching last Sunday on Christmas Sunday, but I was kind of disappointed. Barbara said, Sean, don't let it ruin your Christmas that... um, you had to cancel church because she knows I was super adamant about um, not canceling on, sun, on Christmas morning, but I think it was the best thing to do. But anyway, all that aside, today we're looking at Anna and Simeon, and that just happens to be eight days after the birth, so it just makes sense that we're doing that today anyway. So there, I gave you a heads up. Go ahead and flip over to Luke chapter two, and we're going to be in uh, several verses there, and as you're flipping over there... You know, as I look back to Christmas as a, as a child, one of the things that I remember is our local newspaper doing a countdown to Christmas, and they always displayed it on the front page of the paper, and it's like, you know, I can't remember what day they started it on, but it seemed like the closer we got to Christmas, the longer the days were. I don't know how, but it seemed like there was more than 24 hours in a day the closer we got to Christmas. And there were times as a kid that that anticipation and excitement was almost unbearable because the reality is when we wait for something, it can be excruciating. I want you to be honest with me for a moment. Don't raise your hand, but you know, think about your answer. How many of you like to wait? <laughs> I mean, I would venture to say that most of us in this room don't like to wait. Waiting in our culture has become even harder with the advances that we have in technology and just average processes that we have in life. We live in a culture that craves instant gratification. Businesses recognize this and they work to make sure that their customers can experience as little weight as possible. Amazon Prime promises one day shipping on a lot of their products because they know people don't wanna wait for that stuff. You know, restaurants are always working to streamline the drive through I remember when Taco Bell had a display when you went through their drive through and it showed you how long you had been waiting, and it was kind of twofold. They wanted you to see, oh, I've only been waiting 30 seconds, but they also helped them, it also helped them track how long are people waiting to, to get their food. And I'll tell you, one company that has this absolutely as close to perfect as possible is Chick-fil-A. You pull in a Chick-fil-A drive through and it looks like there's 200 cars in front of you, but you're out of the line in less than five minutes. You know, people don't like to wait. Now, for some of you younger kids that are in here this morning, you should have seen the internet speeds in the 90s and early 2000s. <laughs> you know, you see the little thing spinning on your phone, it's been 10 seconds. Why isn't this loading? dial up, you know, (laughs) it seemed like you had to wait 10 minutes just to log on to be able to use the internet. I mean, think about it. Everything, including mashed potatoes, are instant now. We've been conditioned to expect instant gratification, and we're not good at waiting. But waiting is what this season is really all about. It is symbolic of the faithful remnant of Israel waiting for the arrival of the Messiah. And in turn, it reminds us that we are waiting for Jesus' second coming, his return. So today, we're going to look at two individuals that faithfully waited for the Messiah. Luke records their story. And I think as we look at who they are and what they did while they waited, it helps us take away a few things that we should consider as we wait as well. Their names are Simeon and Anna or Anna. And like John the Baptist, they're not 
mentioned in most Christmas plays or nativity scenes, though I will tell you, my family and I got to go down to the Creation Museum to the Christmas Town exhibit uh, this week, and Anna was in their um, display. She had a whole talking part where she talked about what it was like to encounter the Messiah. But outside of that, I haven't seen Simeon or Anna displayed anywhere around Christmas time. But despite that, they demonstrate some extremely important qualities that I think are important for us, not as we wrap up this series only, but as we prepare for this coming year. Uh, so I just want to recap where we've been here real quick before we get into that. Week one, this is what we did. We looked at the prophecies of Jesus' birth from the book of Isaiah. And we looked at the message that Isaiah proclaimed to the people, and, and that message applies to us as we prepare for the second coming. And the message was simple. Isaiah said this to, his, to the people he was writing to, and this is the message for us today. As we prepare him room, we need to be making room for a king. That's important. Week two, we looked at John the Baptist, and specifically, we looked at his message and his method. And this is what we learned from John the Baptist. His message was simple, repent. Repentance involves conviction, confession, and a commitment to be changed. And his method was humility and self-discipline. Week three, we took a closer look at Mary and Joseph, and we learned that we are all given an opportunity to trust God's plan, even when it doesn't make sense. And that's what they demonstrate for us, that we have to choose God's plan, even when things don't look like the way they thought they would. Last week, or I guess two weeks ago now, uh, we dispelled some common misconceptions about the innkeeper and talked about the uniqueness of the shepherds. And the takeaway point was this, God uses humble people in humble places to accomplish huge things for humanity. And so today, we're going to wrap up the birth story of Jesus eight days after his birth, looking at these two individuals specifically. I don't have the entirety of the text on the screen, but if you have the YouVersion Bible app, I put um, a virtual bulletin on our church's page. You should be able to find that, or it's on Facebook. I shared the link. All the text is on there to give you the opportunity to take your own notes as well. We're going to start at verse 22. When the time had come for the purification rites by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Luke's talking about Jesus here. They're taking Jesus. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, I just want to stop and give you a little side note here. This is a really good indicator um, of the financial standing of Mary and Joseph. Because the requirement was if you could afford it, a lamb or a goat. And if you were poor, you could bring a dove or pigeons. And so we know Mary and Joseph, according to Luke, brought a dove or pigeons because they were poor. They couldn't afford any better sacrifice, but they brought what they could. Now there was, in verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, soul too. And I just want to focus on one verse in that text. What we see is, 
you know, an account of Mary and Joseph going to the temple because they are keeping the requirements of the law. The law requires that every firstborn male needs to be consecrated to, to the Lord. They have to do that at the temple. They go to do that. Jesus is there uh, on his eighth day for his circumcision. And they're fulfilling all of these requirements. And when they get there, they meet this man, Simeon. And Simeon's an interesting character to me. Because if you look at verse number 25, this is what you find. There was a man in Jer- Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. So two things just from this one verse jump out at me. Because this is what Luke does. He tells us who this man is and, it, and what he was doing. And that's where I want to start. I want to start with what he was doing. So our English translations say that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. There are two ways that this word can be interpreted. Literally, like we have in our English translation, to wait. Or uh, if you have the New American Standard Bible, I believe they translate this word, which is the other way it can be translated from Greek, is he was looking forward to the consolation of Israel. Now, some of you are saying, well, what's the difference, whether we're waiting or whether we're looking forward? I read an article a couple weeks ago called Waiting for Jesus, Lessons We Can Learn from Simeon and Anna. And Jeff Peabody, he's the author, he wrote this about the difference in definition. And he was speaking specifically toward looking forward. He said, that emphasis, looking forward, transforms the concept of waiting from excruciating endurance to active participation. And as we work through these these individuals today, what we're going to see is we see two individuals who were actively participating in the waiting. Because I want you to write this down. This is our first takeaway from the text. Waiting can breed apathy. And this is what we're called to. When we look at Simeon and Anna, what we see is that we are called to be active participants, not apathetic spectators. These two individuals, you're going to find out, they're not just sitting around twiddling their thumbs, just waiting. Oh, is this the day? Is this the day? They were actively participating in this process of looking forward to the Messiah. We are called to be active participants, not apathetic spectators. So who was Simeon? That's what he was doing. Who was he? Luke doesn't tell, tell us anything about Simeon's physical characteristics. We don't get any idea of what he looks like. Some people say that he's very old, but we don't know that for sure. We don't, we're not given an age. We just know that he says, now you can dismiss your servant. So we assume that he's old. I heard somebody say, you know, if he's following Jewish customs, which he was, he would have looked a lot like Santa Claus. He would have had a big, long, white beard if he was an old man because they're commanded not to trim the edges of the beards. So it's kind of interesting that here in this story we see a character that looks like what we depict Santa Claus as. But we don't know any of these things for sure because Luke doesn't tell us what he looks like. What he does when he talks about who he is is he focuses on his spiritual qualities. And I think that's important. He even tells us his name, which to me his name is very fascinating. His name, we pronounce it in English, Simeon. But in Hebrew, it would have been more like Shemian. And it's from the word Shema. Uh, This is a word that means to hear. If you're familiar with some of the Jewish prayer customs, they would pray the Shema every day from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, that says, Hear Shema. That's why they call it the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So Simeon's name literally means to hear. So here we have this man who is waiting, expecting, looking forward to the Messiah, whose name means to hear. And this is what Luke says about him. He was righteous 
and devout. Maybe it says just and devout in some of your translations, but the word is, the Greek word is translated either righteous or devout. And it carries a legal kind of standing. So what we look at this, this word, what does it mean for Simeon to be righteous? I, I think Luke is portraying two relationships here. He's talking about his relationship with other people, and he's talking about his relationship with God. Simeon was a guy that was in good standing with people. He was just. He was also in good standing with God. He was more than in good standing with God because Simeon go, or Luke goes on to say that he was devout. He was devoted to God. That word literally means to take hold of well. Might, you might say reverenced God. You know, my kids and I had some conversations this week about the differences in denominations. And the, some of the discussion was about the differences between the Catholic Church and the Christian Church, Protestant Church. And I made sure to tell them one of the things that I appreciate about the Catholic Church is their reverence. Because if you've ever been to a Mass, they, they do a lot of things that symbolically show how reverent they are to God. And we talked about how they take communion and somebody holds a plate under the priest as he gives communion because they don't want anything to fall and hit the ground. It's, it's an act of reverence. And when, we, when I talked about that, I thought about Simeon. This is, this is a guy that's so devout that he's careful. He's taking hold of, well, anything that has to do with God. And there's, a, there's another clue in here that Luke gives us, and I think this is the big clue that we really need to hold, grab onto that tells us what kind of person Simeon was, what his life looked like. I want you to notice how many times Luke mentions the Holy Spirit in just these few verses we read. Three times. Okay, so here's a seminary trick for you. If you are reading a text and you find something mentioned three times, that's important. That's what they, te that's what they teach in seminary. If something is repeated three times, they want you to pay attention here. And so this is what we get with Simeon. Luke mentions three times the Holy Spirit in association with Simeon. He said that the Spirit was upon him. He said that the Spirit revealed to him and that he was moved by the Spirit. This is what Warren Wearsby says. Warren Wearsby says that Simeon was led by the Spirit of God, taught by the Word of God, and obedient to the will of God. And I think when we look at what he says and what Luke says about the Spirit, it's the same thing. He was led by the Spirit of God, which means when he woke up in the morning, he had a decision to make. He said, am I going to do what I want to do today, or am I going to try to do what God wants me to do today? And Simeon was led by the Spirit to go to the temple that morning. Now, taught by the Word of God, what does that really mean? When we see it in this text, Luke says he, it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Now, I think we have a tendency to do a couple different things. Number one, when we see that, we really don't know what it means. We say, what does it really mean that you know, it was revealed by the Spirit? Or we picture, for some of us that maybe grew up in a more charismatic movement, we picture the Holy Spirit in ghost form show up and speak to Simeon. But what's really going on? Well, I think this is what's happening here. Simeon... It was revealed by the Holy Spirit to Simeon because Simeon was devoted to the scriptures. He was taught by the word. Simeon understood that the Holy Spirit was writing the scriptures through men. And so he devoted his time to studying those scriptures, to looking for those things that those prophets were saying about the coming Messiah. And he just let it saturate into his core. Because studying those Old Testament scrolls showed Simeon what he needed to be on the lookout for. That's how he knew when he held that child. That's how he knew he was holding the Messiah. It was because he knew the characteristics from the scripture. And he was obedient to the will of God. Imagine how easy, if Simeon was an old man, imagine how easy it would have been for him to wake up and say, you know what, God, I've been looking for a long time now. 
I'm old, my beard's white. I've been looking for a long time. I think I'll just stay home today. You know, how many days in a row have I gone to the temple and looked for the Messiah and he hasn't showed up? So today I think I'm just going to take a break. But he didn't. He was obedient to the will of God. He was moved by the Spirit. So here's some things that I want you to write down that we need to take away from this. Because I think when we see these characteristics, it shows us what it looks like to be an active participant rather than an apathetic spectator as we wait for Jesus. We have to be led by the Spirit. We have to learn how to be sensitive to the Spirit's moving. I mean, this is one of the characteristics that sets the church apart from the rest of the world. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if we're not sensitive to the Spirit's moving, we'll kind of wander and stray and go our own way. But like Simeon, we have to be led by the Spirit. And in order to be led by the Spirit, we have to be taught by the Word. And this doesn't happen by casually reading the Bible. It requires an intentional approach to studying the Scriptures. Simeon didn't just wake up and do a devotional every morning. Simeon studied. He followed the patterns. He followed the themes. Most likely, Simeon could recite a large portion of the scrolls from memory. That was pretty common. So for us, when we think about being taught by the word, we have to take our game up a notch. I mean, daily devotionals are great, but daily devotionals do not help you be led by the spirit. Daily devotionals do not prepare you to look for the coming Messiah. Daily devotionals make you feel good. They boost your spirit. But being led by the Spirit requires deep, intentional study of the Scriptures. Uh, I forget who the author was, but it was a book on spiritual disciplines. Uh, Whitney, I think. Donald Whitney, maybe. Uh, he made a comment in this book that has stuck with me, and I read this book probably 10 plus years ago now. He said, if every Christian in the United States got their Bible off the coffee table and dusted it off, we'd have the largest dust storm in history. Biblical literacy in the United States, the church in the United States is at an all-time low. And what that tells me is people don't study the scriptures. Being obedient to the will of God. You know, one of my favorite verses is, is Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. But that verse does not mean that we are to be inactive. That verse means that we are to have an inner stillness while we're actively participating outwardly as we await for Christ's second coming. So there we have Simeon. Now we have Anna. Now I'm just going to give you a real quick thing here. Anna is, I think, when I look at Anna and I think about how Luke has presented this, this account to us of Jesus' birth, Anna is more significant than we would want to admit. I mean, Luke has done an amazing job at emphasizing the role that women play in God's plan. I mean, think about this. Think about how Luke highlights Mary's perspective of the birth account. And now we get to the recognition of Messiah. And it's not just a man who recognizes the Messiah, but you also have a woman recognizing the Messiah. Now look at, look at Anna, verse 36. There was also a prophet. I think you should underline that. I, I think it should say prophetess. There was also a prophetess, Anna, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. When Mary and Joseph had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. So here we have this prophetess, this woman prophet, who was married, and like Mary, she was probably pretty young when she was married. She was only married for seven years, and then her husband died. 
And now we have, um, depending on how you translate it, she's either 84 years old or she has been a widow for 84 years. So we know that Anna is old. She's an old lady. And she is waiting. Okay? She's waiting. Just like Simeon. But she's not apathetically waiting. She's actively participating while she's waiting. Now, what does her active participation look like? Luke says that she was devoted. She devoted her time to something. He said she never left the temple, but she worshipped. Now, that's, that's an interesting word. She worshipped. Night and day, fasting and praying. Um, the King James Version, the New American Standard Version, does not use the word worship. They use the word serve. So she never left the temple but served night and day, fasting and praying. Now here, I want you to understand something. In our modern minds, we look at these words and we put these two things in two completely different categories. We have worship over here and we have serve over here. When we think of worship, we think of what we just did a few minutes ago. We play a few songs, we all stand, we all sing together, and we worship. When we think of serve, we think of maybe uh, like Carla put the dinner, the cookies and the coffee, and all those ladies help prepare all that food and maybe some men. We think of that as serving. We think of going downstairs and teaching in junior church as serving. And worshiping, you know, I've heard people say, hey, well, I, I really have a hard time serving, volunteering, because I'm missing, missing worship. Anna was a worshiper. She worshiped while she waited, but that doesn't mean that she turned the radio on to Caleb and sang along with Bethel, Bethel worship. This is important for us to understand, especially as we start this next year and we start down a path at Hannah's Creek where today I was sho I'm shocked, honestly, that we have this large of a crowd on New Year's Day. But there's some changes that are going to have to be made. Anna lived a life that was devoted to God, and this is what Luke called worship. It was service. See, there's no distinction between worship and service. It's the same thing. It's devotion to God. And this is what he defines this worship or service as. He says she was fasting and praying. Fasting and praying. You know, like... Our, our culture has conditioned us to not like to wait. We want instant gratification. We also don't like to fast because we don't like to feel hungry. It's uncomfortable. In, in our society, comfort is important. Matter of fact, we think if we're not comfortable, we think something is wrong. But biblically speaking, it's the opposite. If you're comfortable, something is wrong. When you're uncomfortable, that's when God is moving. And so here we have Anna devoting her time to fasting. And it's, a, it's a spiritual discipline, and we're going to have a whole series on spiritual disciplines. But this is one of the mis, most misunderstood spiritual disciplines in the church. I've been part of churches that have looked at fasting like this. And I've heard people say this, well, I'm fasting so that God will do this. You can fill in the blank. I'm fasting because I want God to do this for me. That's not the point of fasting. See, fasting is when we give up something physical, replace it with something spiritual for this intent, to help get us in tune with God. When we fast to get God in tune with us, you're just hungry. Fasting is about us getting in tune with God. So Anna was fasting. And, and what this means in her context is she was going without food. And what, what was she doing as she pushed the the plate away and she said, you know what, I'm not going to eat this meal. What was she doing? She was praying. She was replacing that time of physical nourishment with spiritual nourishment and she was praying. Now there's a lot of different words in the New Testament for prayer, but Luke uses a word that should be understood as petition, which means she was asking God for something. You say, wait a minute, I thought you just said it wasn't to get God to do anything. But here's what I think Anna was asking God for. Based on the context of this narrative, I think Anna was asking God to send the Messiah. It's, it's a lot like the prayer that Jesus demonstrated when he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think that's probably what Anna was praying. God, send us your Messiah. 
send us your Messiah because when she gets to the temple that day, her petition turns to thanksgiving because that's the first thing she does. She offers thanks to God when she sees the baby. So here's what Anna teaches us. Anna teaches us that we should be worshiping while we wait. When we think about active participation versus excruciating endurance, we need to worship while we wait. But worship is more than singing. Worship is a lifestyle that's devoted to God, and that's what we see here with Anna. Anna's, Anna's devotion was shown through her fasting and praying. So today, we're kicking off the new year. Everybody's probably got their new year, new me. This is, these are my resolutions. These are the goals. These are the things that I want to accomplish. But I think this should be at the top of every single one of our lists, even mine. We need to resolve to be more devoted to God. More devoted. Listen, waiting is hard. I'll be the first to admit it. I don't like to wait either. Waiting is one of the most difficult things that I have to do in life. But we have to, we have to take a different approach to our waiting. Right? A lot of the things that we're called to as followers of Jesus are like the exact opposite of what our culture expects from us. See, our culture says, you shouldn't have to wait, you should have it now. But God says, you have to wait. That's his plan. There's waiting involved. Culture says, well, if you have to wait, you should at least be comfortable. God says, while you're waiting, you're not gonna be very comfortable if you're doing it right. You know, this is a far cry from the, from the uh, prosperity, health, and wealth gospel, right? This is not what the Bible pro- projects following Jesus like. This waiting involves some pain. It involves some suffering. But that pain and suffering gets easier when you're participating like I ask you to participate. So while we wait, while it's difficult to do, the challenge is, can we be devoted in the waiting? Can we be active participants Can we be people, if somebody were to sit down and write out a narrative of our life, would they use the same words to describe us? Righteous, devout, fasting, praying. Are those the words that would describe us as we prepare room for Jesus and his second coming? Now, here's the challenge. We've spent five weeks now, five weeks, and we've only scratched the surface of what it looks like to prepare every day, prepare and anticipate the return of Jesus. The challenge is, will we take what we've learned and apply it to our lives? Because that's what separated the sheep from the goats, so to speak, in the the days of Jesus. There was two groups of people really represented in, in these accounts. You had the apathetic spectators and you had the active participants. You had Israel who had kind of bought into all the other secular stuff that was going on and mixed a bunch of different stuff with their religion. And then you had the faithful remnant, people like Anna and Simeon, people that were truly devoted, people that were truly righteous, people that were fasting and praying. And both groups of people heard the same message. Both groups of people read the same prophets. Both groups of people listened to the same scrolls recited. And you had two completely different responses. You have a group that prepared and a group that just endured. Excruciating endurance. And the response of those people that prepared was joy. When they came to the temple and they encountered this child, they recognized salvation. Long before the cross, long before his suffering, they recognized salvation at that moment because their preparation had brought them to that point that they knew salvation was in a person. Do we know Jesus that intimately? Let's pray.
God, I ask that you take my words and that you would allow your spirit to continue to move and churn within us. Reveal your truths to us. We come now to what we mark as the beginning of a new year, God, and I ask that you would give us all the faith that we need to be the people that you've called us to be. Father, help us to be intentional about our lives as we prepare for Jesus' second coming, as we wait. Lord, in those times when the waiting becomes uncomfortable and sometimes when there's suffering in the waiting, God, we ask that you would be our comfort, that you would be our joy, you would be our strength. Help us to take all these things that we've learned over the course of these five weeks about these individuals that you led your spirit to write about. Help us to take those characteristics and those qualities and apply them to our own lives. And Father, like Anna and Simeon, may we know your word so intimately that when Jesus shows up, we recognize who he is. We pray these things in his name. Amen.